welcome to all of you. My name is Margaret Rosenmeier Olsen and I'm Associate Director at the European Water Association, the EWA. And on behalf of the EWA, I would like to welcome you all to this first webinar in our Brussels online series about the European Green Deal and the Blue Challenges. And this webinar is sponsored by uh, Steinzeug Keramo. We have some very exciting guests with us today. And uh, to lead us on this journey, uh, we have Wendy Franken. And Wendy Franken, she is uh, Managing Director of Blario in Belgium. And she is also the Chair of the EWA European Policy Committee. So welcome to all of you. I hope you will enjoy this webinar. And Wendy, welcome to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome also from my part. Uh, we will start with, uh, with Jutta Paulus, and uh, she's a member of the European Parliament for the Greens since 2019. Uh, she's a member of the Committees of Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, Industry, Research, Energy and Transport, and she is also the rapporteur for the revision, uh, revision of the EU MRV regulation, if I am informed right. Mrs. Uh, Paulus, I give uh, the screen to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, I might just give some impressions from um, the parliamentary perspective. Um, and when we're talking about the blue challenges, most of us are thinking of water, drinking water, maybe wastewater, maybe rivers, but um, the, the highest challenge in my view lies actually in restoring a healthy ocean. Up to now, um, our oceans have absorbed um, the most of climate warming that has taken place so far. And um, it has even traveled to the deepest places of the ocean where you can find today the impact of climate change already. But by taking up so much heat and CO2, um, the ocean has actually managed to to shift our attention away from climate change a lot because we didn't see all of its impacts and um, but of course it does have a very high impact on the ocean also by the acidification which takes place through co2 which severely harms and destroys coral reefs which will be a, an increasing problem as 20 percent of all marine organisms depend on healthy coral reefs and a lot of people worldwide are depending on ocean food as a source for protein. So this is why we have fought in the file that I, I have the honor to be rapporteur um, of CO2 emissions from maritime transport. This is why we have fought for having an ocean fund in, um, in the ETS proposal that we are sending to the Commission and to the Member States. We are calling for including maritime transport in the ETS so that the only sector that is not yet regulated in under climate um, objectives in any country worldwide will finally um, have to take into account the pollute to pace principle just like everyone else and when in this fashion we could generate revenues which could be used on the one hand for further decarbon or for <laughs> starting with decarbonization on of shipping, research development of emission-free vessels, but also uh, we want to put aside part of this money into an ocean fund for the protection of marine areas because we do have quite a few marine protected marine protection areas, but um, they're horribly underfunded, and therefore we don't even know whether the the whether they're fulfilling the protection purpose. Um, just some days back, back I read um, a news alert that the Russian Federation wanted to test their new giant icebreaker. So they sail in the Arctic trying to find ice which is more than three meters thick, uh, thick in order to be able to test their icebreaker. They didn't find any. They didn't find any in the whole of the Arctic. And the Laptev Sea, um, which is usually frozen at this time of the year, has not um, developed any ice coverage. So we're really in a climate emergency and we have to um, 
pay attention that we're not overwhelming our ocean, which has so many services for us with its, um, with its effects. Um, also, we have, are already seeing a weakening of the Gulf Stream circulation, which of course would affect Europe a lot. Um, my dear colleague, Catherine Chabot, who was working with me on the file on maritime transport, has written a letter asking for a marine protected area in Antarctica, where many MEPs are co-signing. So I think in European Parliament, we are paying close attention to the health of our blue ecosystems. Also, we are right now discussing a, um, a strategy how to best um, combine offshore wind parks and fishery because a lot of fishermen are afraid that they might not be able to fish the way they used to um, when they cannot sail in areas where offshore wind is being built. So we have to be careful in our spatial planning to really take into account the views of all stakeholders, be it energy providers, be it fishery, be it, um, of course, nature protection so that every um, every single every single um, community also is um, can have their say and we find a good solution for everyone. There are quite a few things that um, are more or less connected to water, water protection. For example, at the moment we are discussing the Circular Economy Action Plan, which is also important for um, European Water Association because about half of total greenhouse gas emission and more than 90% of biodiversity loss and water stress come from resource extraction and processing of materials, fuels and food. So um, we are seeing that we have a lot of um, potential in digitalization. For example, it would be easier to track um, materials and to make the best use um, if you really know about their quality. And of course, we have to optimize the use of energy and natural resources. And this is very closely linked to a circular economy. We have to move away from the linear way of digging something out, making use of it, and then throwing it away. And this is also closely connected to the way we are um, doing transport. At the moment, we are shipping around a lot of things just because it's easier or it's less expensive to ship them somewhere to just do a very very little piece of work and then ship it back because there is so not sufficient cost actually allocated to the transport sector and um, as I said I am the rapporteur on maritime transport and of course transport by by waterways is by far the most efficient way to transport things. But there again, we should think about what do we want to transport? How far do we want to transport it? And um, by which means do we want to transport it? Um, in our file CO2 emissions, we have not only called for inclusion of the sector in the EU ETS, but also for a, an efficiency target of minus 40% by 2030 which could be achieved by, for example, additional wind propulsion, by um, a better engine, by a more efficient hull of the ship, or just by going slower, which would, of course, also save fuel, um, because we really need to curb the emissions in all sectors, and um, shipping is one of the most hardest to decarbonize, just as aviation, where we at the moment cannot think of anything but synthetic fuels, which of course would need a lot of renewable energy in order to be carbon neutral. But I think um, we should focus on electrification of the transport sectors, which can be electric electrified, be it car transport or lo lorries or even trains where we don't have electrification all over Europe and all the air pollution which is generated by um, burning fossil fuels, of course, will end up in our waterways sooner or later. There is one other very big issue which is food production and the farm to fork strategy clearly states that um, the the food production results in air, water and soil pollution and this problem has to be tackled uh, very, very urgently. 
because the consumption of natural resources, by the way, we produce food nowadays, and also the consumption of clean water is something that we cannot do forever because of the limitations that nature set. And um, I'm very disappointed uh, on the outcome of the CAP, which was voted on in Parliament last week, where um, there was a sufficiently large majority who said, well, never mind the scientists, we'll just want to carry on as before. But um, in my home country, Germany, there are some providers of drinking water who have increasingly difficulties to filter out nitrate, to filter out pesticides, which inevitably arrive in groundwater bodies um, later or sooner, I should say, but they will travel through the various layers of soil and ground and they will end up in people's drinking water. Um, I think what a lot of people do not really realize is that ecosystems provide these essential services like cleaning up water for us without charging us anything. Um, especially when it comes to peatlands, wetlands, where we have this enormous buffer also for for water, um, for, for those rain events, which are inevitable to come with climate change. We need these nature-based solutions in order to have clean drinking water for people, in order to have buffer for water in our ecosystems, um, to be able to get along with those wild weather e events, which are increasingly hitting um, people and nature in Europe. And um, I was very glad, on the other hand, that the Commission published a very ambitious strategy for the sustainable chemi chemicals, because the zero pollution ambition for a toxic-free environment is one of the huge challenges that we also have to tackle. Today, one third of the babies that are born in the European Union are um, have me methyl mercury levels in their blood, which are above the current limits one third of all babies. And so this makes it very clear that we have to protect not only ourselves as humans, but also nature from the cocktail of persistent pollutant pollutants, which can be analyzed in our waterways, in the soil throughout Europe. And that is something we have, in my view, neglected for too long. We have heard about the Commission work program for 2021, very ambitious one, and there are quite some issues that are closely connected to clean waterways, for example, the Zero Pollution Action Plan for water, air and soil, of course, a legal framework on the restoration of healthy ecosystems, the evaluation of the sewage sludge directive, which is, also, of course, also connected to clean water, the revision of the Directive on Industrial em Emissions, the revi revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive, which is closely connected to our climate goals, and quite a few, I will not reiterate all the Commission's work program, of course, but I think it is very clear that in order to deliver on the Green Deal, we have to think all sectors together. We cannot um, for example, when we are talking about industrial emissions directive, of course, we have to talk about what is technically feasible, but we also have to talk about what health costs are associated with air pollution, what costs are associated um, with water pollution when suppliers of drinking water have to employ ever more expensive techniques or technologies in order to fulfill the task of providing the population with clean water. We have to think about how do we actually do agriculture in future when we cannot count on having sufficient rainfall in spring, for example, to grow certain crops. Um, how do we handle the problem of rivers um, having ever less water in summer with a problem which will, of course, increase in, um, in all in all countries depend. We have to think all sectors together and we have to make sure that we do not have trade-offs where we harm one ecosystem on the expense of another. We have to think everything together in order to be able to deliver really a comprehensive Green Deal. Thank you very much. Veronica Manfredi, and she's the Director of Quality of Life and DG Environment of the European Commission's 
since February 2018. The Directorate plays a crucial role in leading Europe towards a zero pollution ambition and contributes to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis, as well as to the transition to a cleaner and circular economy, also to, to enhanced water efficiency. Mrs. Manfredi is constantly inspiring and motivating us. For the period 2020-2022, Mrs. Manfredi is the president of the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine and on behalf of the EU. Uh, and I would like to give you the floor for uh, your presentation about the uh, water policy within 2019-2024, uh, about the, the priorities of the European Commission. What is the state of the play and key challenges ahead. Good afternoon, first of all, to you. Um, I belong to the very disappointed uh, citizens of Europe, I must say, in the light of the recent development in uh, Council and European Parliament, because uh, uh, true, in an ideal world, maybe we should have, uh, as Commission, even come up with a yet rebound proposal, but there were quite a lot of hooks in the original Commission proposal to give meat and help in uh, using this cap to implement the farm to fork strategy, we have come up with a very punctual set of recommendations for Council and Parliament to secure that maybe some targeted adjustments could develop the farm to fork strategy and the outcome is not uh, glorious, it seems. So, so I must say, you know, I, I know that in the uh, institutional triangular debate between Commission, Parliament and Council, it's always a little bit of delicate tension, but this would have been a golden opportunity to show uh, commitment uh, from everyone. Uh, let's see how we can uh, limit damages, is my take, but indeed, uh, very happy to engage further in the debate. Uh, uh, so today my aim is simply to give you a little bit of an overview of recent developments. It's true that they will only have meaning and sense to the extent that they are translated into practice. Uh, we can move already to the next slide, which essentially encompasses for you uh, the very targeted, punctual, focused six policy priorities of this von der Leyen Commission. I think uh, no one can criticize us for not being very uh, targeted this time. Uh, I think they all make sense, a lot of sense, and they're all somehow interplaying with each other. The Green Deal, the economy that works for people and gives back, as the President always likes to repeat more than it takes, a Europe fit for the digital age, protecting the European way of life, but also kind of promoting it. Huh? It's not a, a message of negativity here. Stronger Europe in the world and a new push for European democracy. I would say that naturally for any one of us dealing with water management issues and environmental sustainability, actually this agenda serves all of them. And I think it's not a, a coincidence that out of all of this, clearly the European Green Deal is recognized as the top political priority. And we can move to the next slide, please, which zooms a little bit uh, into what the President promised to do when she took office and as delivered. Uh, you are aware of the fact that the Chapeau European Green Deal communication, the one that somehow is itself introducing this con concept of uh, looking at systemically at all the components of uh, the environmental crisis and how to tackle them jointly, has been delivered by the European Commission services 10 days after the President took office. So I think uh, we'll be really delivering on that. We can move to the next slide. Please. Uh, and you all by now are familiar with this little, uh, with this little scheme that is very dear to my heart for a number of reasons. First of all, because I always like to stress that you see, you don't see it explicitly, but actually water is everywhere, literally in each of these uh, priorities. And we are securing uh, that all the policy papers that are coming out of the college indeed do reflect these. So, so far you will have in particular seen uh, the farm to fork strategy, the biodiversity strategy, um, the, the, the work on uh, smart and sustainable mobility is very advanced. I, I do believe we will be able to deliver on that one before the end of the year. Uh, you have seen our climate law, you have seen uh, what is happening in the field of clean uh, energies uh, and also circular economy on which a paper has been also adopted. And you will see that in all these trends, somehow water is present under the name of circularity, under the name of efficiency, under the name of managing water quantities. We can move to the next slide. 
and as we know uh, clearly uh, water also very much serves the over encompassing goal of securing that no one is left behind if there is one symbolic natural resource which is also the symbolic uh, icon of fighting poverty i think it's water uh, so for me really this is a very important social agenda as well uh, this slide essentially kind of depicts for you the complexity and the multiplicity of work strands that is ongoing. I would stress out of all of those in particular, the actions that are taking place under Horizon, both Horizon 2020, uh, under which we have recently launched an over 1 uh, billion action to support the green and digital transition, so a very important uh, uh, co-funding of a number of important research and scientific projects to fill what we call our knowledge gaps and at the same time also bring closer to the market the most promising cleaner technologies and water treatment and water management technologies but also as you see a number of very important deliverables let me mention in particular the strategic approach to pharmaceutical and environment for which uh, colleagues in European Parliament uh, have been having a hearing uh, not many days ago uh, where my commission, Commissioner Sinkevicius, presented a little bit of state of play. So we can move to the next slide. Please. Uh, and this is briefly to uh, show to you that, uh, of course, uh, this has all been happening in this highly unusual and dramatic COVID-19 uh, period, uh, during which basically we are trying to also develop a common European response. We see, we see how much the response is here and there are still scattered, even within our own member states, uh, the people living in Belgium, we know what we're talking about. Um, but in this COVID-19 pandemics, I think we would all be so dramatically worse off had all the people that are working in the water treatment and sanitation area not been doing relentlessly. And often, thanks to digital monitoring system, the work securing that clean water I would say also cleaned of, uh, you know, were needed of the COVID-19 as such, because we have evidence now that COVID-19 is unfortunately the type of pathogens that does survive some hours in our water. So thanks God, we have the type of chemical treatments um, that enable us to deliver good quality water for drinking purposes, for, you know, all sorts of purposes. Um, and this is thanks indeed to the relentless job of the water industry, which maybe. Uh, has not been receiving all the clapping that we've used to do at eight o'clock for the medical doctors and the nurses. We, we, we all recognize that their role is just heroic, but um, water treatment is an indispensable public service and this has become really now an evidence. So we can move to the next uh, slide. Um, this slide is simply there to recap to you, <laughs> to give you also a little bit of a sense of how much has been happening since uh, December uh, 2019, as I said, the date of adoption of the Green Deal. Uh, I haven't counted them, but maybe I should do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven policy papers touching so many um, uh, domains that are important for water, circular economy, biodiversity, farm to fork, the next generation EU. We will zoom into that in a moment. Um, this strategy also for energy system integration, because I think that an outstanding problem in this area is that sometimes we are not yet seeing as much as we should the, the um, commonalities between working on water and energy efficiency jointly and boosting technological developments that enable us to do both at the same time. But also very much, as I was saying, this uh, public health dimension, uh, the communication that you see mentioned here, which is called short-term EU health preparedness for COVID-19 out outbreaks is the first one that officially recognizes the importance to step up what we call environmental um, monitoring and surveillance. And this is all linked to the fact that thanks to the uh, fantastic joint cooperation of a number of laboratories across our member states, now coordinated by the colleagues of the GRC, with whom we work very closely, um, well, we have found out that had we seen COVID-19 in our wastewaters earlier than we actually did, we could have honestly acted much faster. And now basically out of these lessons learned, there is a project ongoing, uh, of which some of you I'm sure are already aware, uh, that is there to reinforce the surveillance capacity, the alert, the, the, uh, create a system of early warning and alert uh, to make Europe indeed better prepared, more resilient, better equipped, 
And a study and a research is ongoing also to basically better understand the linkages between the presence of COVID-19 in air um, and, you know, also the interplay with the, uh, I would say, gravity of air pollution and to what extent this can also be a vector for COVID-19. So this is an important communication, I would say, to indeed strengthen also our capacity to make use of what we see in the environment to, for the future. Um, of course, uh, very important to underline out of this slide is the fact that in September we have adopted this guidance to all the member states to make best possible use of the um, next generation new funding in their national re resilience and recovery plans, for which deadline for presentation is 30th of April next year. And there, uh, needless to say, we would really hope to see an important role of water and water investments coming up, but this will also depend from um, our respective uh, commitment and capacities to influence uh, decisions in, in the capitals. Very important to stress the adoption recently of the ARUS package, which uh, brings uh, into light, if I may, this is Paulus just building on your conclusions, the importance, sure, I fully agree, uh, people who know my career in the house know how much I'm a, I'm a believer of the role of the Commission as a guardian of the treaty, uh, infringements must have their very ample space. But implementation starts at home. Implementation starts locally, and there where locally things are not delivered. I am also very much a believer of, of the role of uh, um, civic society organizations, which, by the way, they also sometimes include, you know, local business actors uh, that when they have legitimate interest to act. But it's essentially very much in the ARUS package, of course, environmental NGOs that we have in our um, radar uh, of attention uh, and the role that they can play to help the stepping up implementation, make best possible use of all the very many legal bases as transposed in national law for act and improving the situations locally. European Commission, even if you give us so many more resources, uh, I'm afraid we'll always have a certain number of limits to intervene, which doesn't mean that we don't have to do our job to the best we can, but voila, without also proper dynamism back on the ground, we will never get where we have to be. Let's move to the next slide. Well, I've skipped on chemicals, but we will focus into that. And this is all what is forthcoming. So just to tell you, we are really busy. We don't lose any single day of our time. Um, very much in the pipeline, the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe, where uh, we would like, of course, to secure references, cross-references to the uh, strategic approach of pharmaceuticals in the environment as well, whilst recognizing that this strategy is broader and looks at other things, huh, such as the affordability of medicines, the competitiveness also of our um, pharmaceutical industry, but still important not to forget the environmental dimension of things especially now that we've adopted the strategy on chemicals, where all the efforts are there to try and reduce uh, the toxicity of the most of our those ones. Strategy for smart and sustainable mobility, very important for water colleagues from a maritime and inland navigation viewpoint. Uh, fuel you maritime coming up. Uh, at the point in time, we are also discussing at IMO about how to cut greenhouse gas emissions coming from our ships. And as you know, the sulfur cap is coming to force uh, uh, right at the, end, at the beginning of this year for all the maritime sector, uh, thus helping both from the point of view of uh, quality of our seas, but also cutting uh, air pollution. I think time has come indeed to look into alternative fuels for ships. As you know, it's a very big uh, technological challenge. This is possibly one of the areas where we know that we have to catch up and accelerate our efforts and where amongst other hydrogen may look as an interesting solution, but as you know, it's not an easy one. Offshore strategy coming up uh, also very soon, a lot of work in preparation of that. Important, as you know, from a clean energy viewpoint, uh, I think we all look into the possibilities of having a well-functioning offshore wind production system, but on the other way around, how to build um, platforms at seas that are um, the least impactful possible from a biodiversity viewpoint in particular. Uh, so the zero pollution ambition is maybe rather well served by this, but how to preserve biodiversity and avoid uh, unintended other environmental issues. And then, of course, the work on the research and innovation, the strategy on climate change adaptation that is due to come up in 2021, early 2021, um, which is also the year where we would like to come up with a strategy, with a communication on sustainable blue economy, very much intertwined with the zero pollution ambition as well. So quite a lot of, uh, Quite a lot of preparatory work, as I said, ongoing. Uh, the Eco Design Directive mentions a reference as well. 
this is something that, uh, you know, as I always like to say, we can put a lot of targets, a lot of deliverables in our communication, deep down, certain things have really to be transformed in the way they are simply presented and produced and come into consumers' house. Eco design is, in my view, a very tangible directive, which is behind uh, the way in which our cooling system works, our boilers work. And this is where we can indeed introduce also further requirements from a water efficiency viewpoint, looking at how to cut not just greenhouse gas emissions in the name of climate neutrality, but also pollution and securing better water management. So, a lot of food for thought. We can move to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, let's uh, move directly to the next. Very, very briefly, when I wish to zoom a little bit further into the circular economy action plan adopted in March, we can see, moving to the next slide, that we have adopted in there, we have announced in there a, a few really important targets for water to which I want to draw your attention. First of all, the fact that water together with food nutrients is recognized, of course, as a key product value to be addressed in any uh, truly circular economy, so for industrial purposes, but not only. A reminder is made in the strategy about the imminent, well, in two years' time, entry to force, entry to application, I should rather say, across the EU of the water reuse regulation. And here I would like to say big, big thanks to the colleagues of the European Parliament who have been supporting us in this important and challenging file, in particular, Rapporteur Mrs. Simona Bonafè. Uh, and also the facilitation, indeed, of uh, water efficiency further uh, across industrial processes as such. This is a word strand that I would like to particularly link to the ongoing review of the Industrial Emissions Directive. Um, I hope you're aware that we've published uh, recently the Inception Impact Assessment work is ongoing pretty fast on that uh, on that legislative strand for which a revision is already announced by the in the European Green Deal communication itself and it's due for 2021 so very happy to stay associated closely with all of you uh, in this uh, important work strand not to mention the sustainable product policy framework which is also announced in the circular economy action plan which will really aim to set all the key principles uh, for product policy and and product requirements on the market. So link again also to the Eco Design Directive. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, I would also zoom very, very briefly to the fact that there is work announced in the Secure Economy Action Plan on microplastics, uh, including in terms of uh, better feeding our scientific uh, knowledge. You know that, for example, and I must say, as a mother, I find it a little bit disturbing, but we still don't know exactly to what extent microplastic is really dangerous from a health perspective for human bodies. And this argument is constantly brought forward also in co-legislative negotiation, if I may say, uh, by those who believe that, you know, we shouldn't over-regulate, and after all, it's not a drama if you drink a bit of uh, microplastics here and there. We know that it enters our blood, we know that it, uh, you know, it penetrates our skin, but we don't have yet 100% robust evidence as to its gravity from a public health perspective. Still, we have the principle of precaution, I think, in the treaty. So I belong to the camp of those who would like to see this microplastic really better fought uh, at source. This is what the Circular Economy Action Plan tries to do, looking at strategic sectors such as textiles, but also indeed construction, building, um, and here there is a link with the just adopted uh, communication on the renovation wave, but we will zoom into that later. Let's move to the next slide, please. So, in May, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemics, because I must say we managed to adopt a circular economy just, uh, I think it was three days or so, before the total lockdown in Belgium, but uh, the, the, the biodiversity and the farm to force strategy had to be adopted in the midst of the lockdown with all the complexity that comes with that. When we adopted it in May, we agreed on a number of targets and some of which I would like to zoom are particularly relevant from a water perspective. First of all, as you may know, the strategy announces that by 2030, 30% of EU land and sea should be protected, out of which one third under strict protection. And this strict protection basically is, is, is only, again, it concerns only a fraction of the total. And it's indeed the part where we're really talking about, in principle, the need to, to leave nature undisturbed. For the other more than 20%, I would say, 
we have the possibility to use these marine protected areas, nature protected areas, it concerns of course also wetlands where we have rivers, etc. Um, somehow living harmoniously and in an environmentally friendly manner together with you know, sustainable economic activities, uh, which can be of different type, leisure, um, sustainable farming, etc. So this is an extremely interesting area, I think, for really starting to creatively think the world of the future, which can become a, a world of win-win opportunities, also from a profit-making point, but really transforming this into an economic opportunity of development in harmony with nature. Um, let me zoom a little moment on the target on restoring 25,000 kilometers of rivers. It's very dear to our hearts. As you know, uh, today in Europe, we have the most fragmented set of fresh waters of the world. It's also the evidence of the fact that we belong to the uh, most developed parts uh, of our beautiful blue planet. But there is a legacy also of history of the past. Uh, imagine that over 150,000 of our barriers, dams, uh, uh, blocking our rivers are completely obsolete. They're not used at all. Uh, they used to have some purpose in maybe sometimes even centuries ago. Uh, today they're just there. They're no longer used and still they're blocking the normal flow of the rivers, blocking fishes, blocking nature too. So this is really something that is very, very dear to our house and on which we hope to engage with member states, but also with, uh, of course, civil society, businesses, etc. to to restore, to restore nature, because we have heard already of a number of projects, some of which finance under life, that really have created ultimately a lot of win-wins, because when the fish come back, there is also opportunity for some fishing purposes, um, recreational activities that really generate a new type of economy. And of course, everywhere, and this is set everywhere in the biodiversity strategy, but I can tell you uh, that it's also part of our daily job, stepped up implementation of the existing key. Uh, super important, we all agree, and as I said, from Brussels, but also better from the ground. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, maybe we can move further, because this is the farm to fork strategy, indeed, adopted on the same day as biodiversity. Now, this slide is very condensed, so with your permission, also because you can have, I think, my PowerPoint later on circulated, I would just zoom on a few uh, of the uh, most important targets. And for me, not least because it's my department who will have the honor and pleasure to lead on the zero pollution ambition, for me, the most important one clearly are the targets about reducing by 2030 uh, both the use and risk of chemical pesticides, including those containing most hazardous uh, substances, by 50%. And also the 50%, as we say, at least uh, in the in the farm to fork strategy, 50% um, cut in nutrient losses, uh, whilst ensuring that there is no deterioration in soil fertility. And also this target of 50% uh, uh, less when it comes to sales of antimicrobials used for farmed animals and aquaculture. These are really targets that are very dear to me and not only to me, because we know that through this type of pesticides, fertilizers, it's really public health, first of all, that is at stake. It penetrates, it contaminates our soils, it contaminates our water. It's very difficult to get rid of, and I know that I'm speaking to an audience where some of you have a, a direct experience. We have some discussion also together with Mr. Hansen, where we were revising the list of uh, substances attached to the drinking water directive. And I think this is where the job really needs to be done. Let's move to the next slide, please. So let's zoom a moment. Chemical strategy for Europe. This has just been adopted, 14th of October, very, very recent. Let's move to the next. What is that we want to do? I would say that really the overarching message of this chemical strategy is about reversing this pyramid. Today, we often find ourselves in a situation where we, you know, we, we let the chemicals come in. Well, I'm a bit simplifying. I know that we, thanks to ECA, thanks to REACH, we have already a robust regulatory framework in place that tries already and controls already the entry uh, in our markets of some of the most toxic chemicals. But let's face it, very often the, the, the impression is we end up having to clean up, re remedy the damage after somehow we understand that a certain substance is toxic, etc. 
Whereas the principle is a principle of reversion, a principle that looks, first of all, by design to secure that the chemical is indeed safe and sustainable. So first, protect. Protect the health, protect the environment, secure appropriate environmental impact assessment at design level. Minimize and control the risk where there were the chemical proves to be not so terribly as are to still very, very useful. So putting in balance the need for, you know, still allowing certain substances to enter, but securing that they are accompanied by the maximum of measures that minimize their uh, negative uh, impacts. And then only as a last step, possibly get rid out of the market, reduce pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Will we get there? <laughs> I agree with you, it's, a, it's quite a challenge, but yes, I think we can, because we've put forward quite a lot of measures, and provided the Council and the, and the Parliament will help us also in some of the important targeted revisions that we have to carry out, I think uh, the music can change and it can start changing as from this very decade, I hope, within the next five years, actually. So let's move um, to the next slide. Uh, which focuses a little bit, I would say, on some of the more uh, detailed actions, but they're very important for all of you. First of all, because the strategy talks about the mixtures, and we know how much we have these problems of chemical mixtures in waters. I see it under the Water Frame Directive in our readers. I see when we have to revise the Drinking Water Directive, now with the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. So this cocktail effect of chemicals, uh, is something that enters much more in the rather screen of our policy makers thanks to this communication. The idea is to really, you know, step up, study, science, knowledge, but also take more upstream action to reduce their uh, um, toxicity uh, upstream. Also, there are promises to ban the most harmful chemicals in consumer products and to allow their use only when essential, to face out the PFAS, uh, and there I think again, Mr. Hansen, you can be proud together with you and the colleagues in the Council, we have managed in the revision of the Drinking Water Directive to have the first ever EU-wide legislation on PFAS. Well, with the chemical strategy, this comes in support and we want really to progressively face them out unless their use is essential, something that will have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, of course, in the framework of the process with the European Chemical Agency, um, boosting innovation, et cetera, et cetera. The other very important principle for me is one substance, one assessment, simplification, establish a much simpler process to assess the risk and also the, the overall risk of hazard assessment for each substance. And this through a one-stop uh, um, system where ECA will play, European Chemical Agency will play a pivotal role. We can move to the next slide, please. The renovation wave adopted on the same day, as I was saying, of the chemical strategy. For us, this is really the part that also makes us dream a little bit. <laughs> Why? Because the problem is there. Uh, the building stock, uh, schools, hospitals, but also our own houses, as we know, is responsible for 40% of the EU energy consumption, close to 40%, 36 to be precise, of the EU greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and still 70%, 75% of our buildings are basically energy inefficient, 80% uh, of them have been in use, uh, uh, will be in use, will continue to be in use, apologies, even after 2050. So, it's clear that we have to do something about that and to do it fast. They're also responsible, as we know very well, for quite a big chunk of air pollution. Uh, it's, it's the heating system, it's also the cooling system, and also a lot of water leakages. Again, linked to the Drinking Water Directive, we know that there is, even in some of our member states, still lead in some of our water pipes. We have to do something. So, in this communication, we have been announcing and creating some books precisely to make more water efficiency intervention possible um, and also to consider the introduction of systems that enable us also to better harvest rainwater there where it's technologically feasible and of course makes sense. Let's move to the next slide. Another thing that um, I would like to highlight here is the fact that uh, this is all linked also with this very innovative idea the President von der Leyen has been uh, uh, coming up, which is this European Bauhaus. She said that during her State of the Union speech to the European Parliament last September the 16th that she really believes 
time has come to design a style for this green and digital transition that we all want and somehow she would like to start with the design of style of technical solution where I certainly see water technology in um, taking place in the framework of a cradle of you know best minds among architects, uh, engineers, artists, designers um, that can bring to shape solutions that indeed lead as an end result to different ways, much more sustainable ways of living, uh, consuming, uh, uh, and even I would say at some stage traveling, uh, even if we will start really with the built environment as such. So we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, from the dream part, which is not so dream because I can tell you that a lot of things are happening <laughs> already. Yesterday I was so pleased to be part of this European premiere of the movie Brave Blue World that shows what is happening even in India, in Nigeria. I mean, this, this change is, is happening, it's just about upscaling it. Uh, but to move from this to the, you know, uh, money part, let me zoom a little bit into the next generation EU this uh, really unique uh, instrument which has been designed by the European Commission to support our member states in what I hope will very soon be the recovery from COVID. For the time being, we all have the impression we're just in the midst of COVID still. This is a recovery instrument of 750 billion euro aimed to boost the EU budget. So it will come on top of the MFF, which is also being discussed right in these hours by the co-legislators. And it will be there during the 2021-2024 period, really, as an extra support over the next three years, because we know what COVID has meant from an economic viewpoint and what's a crisis this has entailed. But the name of this recovery must be the green and digital transition as agreed and uh, announced by our leaders at the maximum level. So we can move to the next slide. Where I want to zoom on what I consider is our common challenge. Uh, supporting our member states in their drafting now of the national recovery and resilience plans. They have to be submitted by April 2021. The guidance document to which I alluded in the previous slide say that they can enter in touch with us as for now basically with the Commission services to look for guidance, to look for help, but essentially they will be in touch with many of you and you will be in touch with them, I, I hope and trust. The member states are invited to present to us an executive summary to describe to us what are the main challenges, but they will not start from a complete tabula rasa environment because we know that the Commission has been issuing since years now country specific recommendations, increasingly so, of course, in the framework of the uh, in European Economic Semester. On top in the environmental area, we have the environmental implementation review. We have done very detailed assessment, as you know, when it comes to water management, uh, looking at the river basin management plans, implementation reports for all the various pieces of law, so they know what their struggles are. And we want to help them in being as focused and as precise as possible in, I would say, first of all, filling the gap of compliance with the key, which is a minimum starting point. But then also design things in such a manner that they create we win opportunities also in terms of job creation and in terms of making themselves stronger. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, what is that we see as a, as a challenge and also as an opportunity, of course, as usual, as usual, that we have different work strands of plants which are in the making. Um, there are the plants under, of course, the um, green and digital agenda, but I'm, I'm thinking here in particular of our own uh, plants, river basin management plans, the, the national air pollution control programs, the climate and energy uh, targets uh, to be met. And it's important that all these plans show coherence and uniformity of visions. So somehow the national recovery resilient plans are also a fantastic opportunity for our member states, if I may say so, to put order uh, and secure that all the vision are perfectly aligned. Something that sometimes we have said ourselves, uh, we were noticing it was not really the case, uh, the various departments looking into these various national plans. So it's important to secure maximum coherence, I would say, at the up, upper possible levels of the national administrations. Let's move to the next slide. We see that these national recovery and resilience plans offer an incredible and unprecedented opportunity to invest in water. 
the instruments are there. You see the first pillar, we have invest U, the just transition mechanism that of course will in particular look at the regions which are more lagging behind, situations where, you know, energy poverty for, and put of poverty. I would say, you know, that we still have over 6 million citizens in Europe which do not have access to uh, water treatment and sanitation, properly speaking. So I know that often we think of Africa, but we have quite some job to do even in Europe, in certain parts of Europe. React to you, the recovery facility. So the, the, the means are there. It's it's a plethora. You may argue, you know, there is always scope for doing things better, but still, at least the money is there. The member state must very carefully identify its own needs. And as I said, compliance first, but also uh, secure that you follow up on the commission recommendation on a number of things that we have identified as weaknesses. And then I would say for me, very, very important is this third pillar. What are the success factors of any good strategy at national level? First of all, we see that clearly the project with which they will come forward has to be bankable. There must be a medium to longer term vision that brings also money. It makes this must makes also economic sense next to environmental and social one, of course. It must lead ideally to creating new jobs. And there is so much work to be done that I can tell you myself how many, at least 50 different jobs that I see for the future linked to water management. It must show that there is a serious application of the polluter pays principle. And this binds a little bit also with remarks of the previous speaker, uh, Honorable Member Paulus, where she was saying, you know, farmers don't pay, for example, for the water. So I think this message of paying for water is a message that, of course, will always sound politically a bit irritating, as long as it's not linked to an agenda of investment, of applications for water irrigation uh, in an efficient manner, of an agenda for, I give you sludge in return that is not toxic and you don't have to buy the fertilizer, but, you know, an agenda that unites um, opportunities, but also indeed requires people to pay the right price of water. Extend the producer responsibility. So here we're thinking very much also about how to secure that certain particular type of industry that we see, we know, because you, you can always at some stage detect the main sources of pollution, industries or other economic actors, which are the main responsible for pollution, how they could contribute into a fund to also help those that ultimately have to do all the cleanup. Sounds logical, doesn't it? But I'm not sure it's really implemented. And then we have also, also the, the, the challenge of monetizing appropriately the ecosystem services. So once the river is restored, is this something just for the, you know, the sun of the flowers or is it something that brings us so many benefits because the fish come back, because we see climate carbon sink uh, functions, because we see better flood protection. How much money are we actually sparing out of keeping this river in good health? How many more tourists are coming? How many more? And all these needs to be monetized to make a convincing case. So these are for us really the critical factors. And then I have already mentioned a little bit the process, the programming, the coherence. Let's move to the next slide. Well, I don't even de dive into this, but may I leave it with you? These are the colored examples of green investment that we have found so far. It's just a simple summary. Uh, let me just mention maybe, I don't know, promoting industrial symbiosis technologies and projects for the reuse of wastewater in industry. So even without having a water reuse regulation applicable to industrial processes, there are already so many projects ongoing that stimulate and show that you can have and almost close the loop of water in industry processes. Just to mention one, proper treatment of, uh, you know, waste coming out of in the industries out of this symbiosis. Just one example, but so many to mention. Let's move to the next slide. Where, uh, very briefly, because I think time is really running, uh, you, I believe many of you are familiar with the water recce, so I will not even enter into that. This slide simply highlights to you in different colors which pieces of law we have already submitted to fitness check, which ones are new legislation. And this is easy, only two pieces, water reuse and drinking water, and which ones are currently under review. And these are the ones on which I would like to draw your attention. We are currently reviewing the sewage sludge directive in parallel with a possible legislative review of the urban waste water and the bathing water directive together with the marine strategy framework directive, not even mentioned in the slide, but of course linked. Let's move to the next slide. 
what is happening when it comes to the Water Framework Directive, on which we concluded the fitness check last year, quite a lot of things. Uh, when it comes in particular to our findings on chemical pollution, currently we are seeing how we can at best uh, update the current provisions of the directive, and in particular with the uh, um, daughter directive on environmental quality standards, groundwater directive to keep up better with science and update both the list of priority substances in surface water and also the list of groundwater pollutants. So this is currently under review because we want to become better in understanding all the chemical implications. And this has been announced in the chemical uh, strategy very recently. Um, other actions, of course, I already mentioned, the stepping up of the implementation, putting also on the member states the burden to tell us what are the control and enforcement measures that they're really taking, increased investment, better mainstreaming of the water policy objective is in other areas, and you've just heard from me how much this is uh, happening right now, and of course, much more work also on administrative simplification and digitalization, a strand on which we're working both with colleagues in DigiConnect, but also with the colleagues of the European Environment Agency that ultimately are managing for us the databases through which we extract all the data that are being collected from the member states. Let's move from uh, to the next slide, please. When it comes to this one, the, the ongoing revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, which is very important for many of you, uh, I would like to mention that the uh, public consultation is about to be launched, uh, and I would really count very much on the European Water Association to please come up with a position paper to reply, engage with us. So many interesting hoops to make this legislation, I would say, better fit for the, for the, for the new age in which we are, more carbon neutral, more energy efficient, more water efficient as such, and I would say ultimately a source of water we can all reuse. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, when it comes to the revision of the uh, industrial emission directive, I would say that seen from your perspective, I would essentially look at it as a super incredible opportunity to indeed stimulate water efficiency, circularity, water reuse in industrial processes, and this jointly with making the uh, instrument, I would say, a, a source also to possibly further decarbonize the economy. Here it's very interesting, there are some interplays with the ETS review that is currently ongoing as well, and we're working closely with the colleagues of DigiClima to see how at best we can secure, you know, that these accelerate at the same time the depollution and decarbonization efforts. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, I would say, I mean, this goes a little bit more into detail about the timetable. I can think, I think we can skip this one in the interest of time and move to the next slide. So this is my overarching message now. Uh, seen from my perspective, on top of all the many strands I've described, now the focus is for us very much also on preparing a robust, solid zero pollution action plan. The deadline for giving feedback on the roadmap, which has been published at the beginning of this month, is coming to an end the day after tomorrow. So in case you've not yet done, have a look, have your say, but also very importantly, have your say uh, in the next few weeks, we will be launching the open public consultation on that one and our battle to try and bring air, water and soil to a clean status uh, will last for some time, but count on us to act on that with maximum determination. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. I'll be very, very brief um, as you just elaborated a bit on the green infrastructure and um, we fought very hard at the European Parliament to get these elements, green infrastructure, greening of facades, biodiversity elements um, into the European Parliament's resolution or no, in initiative report on the renovation wave. And we, I was a bit sad that they weren't mentioned in the renovation wave um, by the Commission as as strongly, so to speak. So I would like to know what, what happened to those. And um, secondly, I have, have a question to the one um, substance one assessment approach, because what we have heard from a lot of industry um, industry representatives that they said, well, um, we really have to thoroughly um, look at the risk which is associated with the substance and you never know about the risk unless you have studied all possible ex exposure possibilities and in which case these might be restricted and um, we are 
fearing a bit that we would have paralysis by analysis, so to speak, because you can always argue we need more data. But if mm -hmm. um, the need for more data is an excuse for not regulating the substance in question, then it's more of a risk taking this one assessment approach. I, I'm totally with you when it comes to hazards because there are studies, there are toxicity endpoints, it is very, very clear. But we should be very careful in saying we can have one single risk assessment that fits all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very powerful questions, of course. On the first one, if I can be very frank with you, uh, Mrs. Paulus, I think something has to do with the fact that inside the European Commission as well, we're still evolving. We're still kind of maturing to this new way of looking at things in a systematic manner. And once at the end of the day, no one is really saying no. I can tell you I have my own part of uh, pedagogic work to do. And that's why actually I'm always very happy when uh, from the outside, the parliament, the stakeholders, the organization come and make a case for the commission indeed continuing on this path of being holistic in its approach. So I agree with you, uh, the, 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 the picture is positive. It could be even better if everyone would be 100% convinced and embracing. But let's face it, I think that this environmental agenda has been propulsed to the front scene after years from what i can witness because i started working in this area in 2018 but after years maybe of not having had the type of relevance and political attention I should have had so i think there is a bit of a legacy of the past that we are all coping with uh, but again i must say all in all if i look at the picture i see a much better picture today than i would have ever dreamed of uh, back in the very beginning of 2018. so this is my take and on your second question um concerning indeed the one substance, one substance one assessment approach first of all let me assure you i will bring it back to my colleagues who are more specialists in the area but my understanding is essentially that whilst the risk that you are allowed cannot be completely um denied um i think that the main purpose is actually to secure that instead of having sometimes plethora of different judgment even if I may say among different European agencies that sometimes are looking at the same type of toxic substances but come to a little bit different conclusions, uh, we harmonize the thinking and uh, in my view could come up actually with better common finding. What I can tell you from the inside of the kitchen is that I noticed that if we are good at bringing together the best brains and we have so many excellent brains in, in our among our experts sufficiently upstream and at sufficiently early stage i think actually we will accelerate ultimately the process but i i recognize with you it's an area where one has to care very be very careful and secure that the governance is the right one and the steer is the right one thank you so much